I honor the land that we sit on. I am uh, currently on unceded Lenape land. We honor the land that was stolen violently. And as we reflect on the role of violence tonight, even after we have seen it, we know that God is holding us and that spirit is with us. Ashe and amen. Today I am here and I am glad that you are here and that you have decided to stay with us. Uh, we will not let violence win. We will not let empire win. Uh, we will let nothing turn us around. So I thank you for being here and for being committed to this on today. I honor what it took for you to arrive here. And I get those words from the Urban Adabex Network. My prayer is that you find a way to center and ground yourself, uh, that you can refresh yourself um, through food or through water. Uh, we are in our homes and so you can find the things that you might need, whether those things might be food or water or a pillow to hold. Uh, I hope that you find the thing that you need. Um, and I'm gonna jump into it. And feel free to say in the chat what it is that you need. And know that we have one another, that we, that we can hold each other in this space. To my friends and my family uh, who may not know, for the last year, I've had the incredible privilege of being a Walter and June Keener Week Fellow. And this fellowship was created to uh, support uh, an emerging leader whose work creates change and challenges power. And the fellowship uh, was also created to honor the life and the legacy of FOR member Walter and the ongoing transformational work of June who just led us in this breathing routine. Walter was an internationally known author, a biblical scholar, a peacemaker, a risk taker, and a pastor with an abiding commitment to creative and active nonviolent resistance to oppressive powers. Walter Wink was a pioneer in participatory sacred text study through which he explored the biblical themes of powers and principalities and the teachings of Jesus on nonviolence. Walter was beloved for the accessibility of his preaching, his teaching, and his writing. He believed the lives and the faith of everyday average people contain the power to transform the world. June Keener Wink, who just led us into a moment of breath, is a dancer and an artist, and was Walter's wife and partner for 33 years. Her body movement work invites the transformative integration of body, mind, and spirit through encounters with sacred text. She continues to create art reflective of her contributions to those workshops that inspire people to connect with their full humanity. So let's take a moment now and honor our dear ancestor, Walter Week, with a brief moment of silence. Walter Wink Presente. You are with us. We also hold a space for um, those who are um, just holding the events of the last 24 hours. Uh, we have um, been witnesses, uh, we have been, we have seen violence occur over and over again, just in the last 24 hours. And so I wanna uplift the name of Jonathan Neely in New York City 
and I want to um, uplift the city of Atlanta. And as we think about, as we think about ways to transform our world, uh, let us hold uh, these folks and these communities in our hearts. My commitment tonight is to have this conversation be accessible and engaging and compassionate and embodied and generative and ongoing. And so, and I have three respondents that are gonna respond uh, to the words uh, that I have written. Uh, and I hope that this uh, talk is also a radicalizing force that awakens the peace and the anti-war movement to call, to do the work of serving this present age. I wanna read a few words of Walter Wink about transformation. He once said that transformation involves the movement from egocentric control of one's life toward a life centered on commitment to the will of God, whatever that might entail and however costly it might turn out to be. It is exploring all the sealed and stale rooms of this God's house we call ourselves and offering all we find to the real owner of forgiveness and acceptance and healing. It is unmasking our complicity in systems and structures of society which violate people's lives and becoming ready agents of justice. It is discovering the unjust and violated parts of ourselves as well. It is a process, not an arriving. We are transforming, not transformed, but all along the way. There are flashes of insight, moments of exquisite beauty, experiences of forgiveness and of being healed, reconciliations and revelations that confirm the rightness of our quest and whet our appetites for more, end quote. This two-part series is an invitation into transformation. This two-part conversation is an invitation to expand the work of the peace movement, connecting the dots between ending war and ending all forms of state oppressive forces, including prisons, detention centers, mental hospitals, and child protective services using some of, the, some of the philosophies and many of the methodologies of June and of Walter. Beloved, I acknowledge that this call is not new. However, I am interested in a dialogue that helps us see the importance of working in coalition and collaboration so that we might win. I am interested in a dialogue that makes connections between interpersonal violence, the violence inflicted by domestic state institutions and international violence. And it all begins with the work the abolitionist work of educators. How many of us know teachers? How many of us uh, are, uh, who are familiar with teachers might have parents that are teachers or aunties or uncles that are teachers? Christian educators, religious educators, professors. You know what I love about the work of teachers? They ask good questions. They ask good questions. And that is also the role of abolition. Mariam Kaba, a premier abolitionist says, the abolition is about the method of asking generative questions. I got to go to the home of, of June and of Walter about a month ago and I sat with hundreds of his questions that he asked over the years. He would write them down on index cards and I got to sit amongst the hundreds of them. Wink says something about questions. He says, developing profound questions is the most crucial aspect and the most difficult part of leadership. Often we fail to be aware of entire dimensions of meaning. 
Our pre-understanding blinds us to other interpretations, questions we have been trained not to ask, never even rise to consciousness. So anxious are we to avoid heresy or to to avoid stirring up issues and feelings for which we have no present antidote. Most times when we young black queer feminist folk talk about the cause of abolition, which is changing how we interact with each other and the planet by putting people before profits, welfare before warfare and life over death in the words of Ruth Wilson Gil Gilmore, we are treated as though we are heretics that merely exist or merely are here to burn everything to the ground. But actually, beloved, the work of abolition is similar to the work of education. It is the work of asking generative questions. It is the work of being a heretic. What the hell? Beloved, there is a war going on. When I wrote the application for this fellowship, I was 26 years old in the midst of a chaotic world. This was three years ago. This is what I wrote. I am a black, queer, cash poor person from the rural South. I am coming to terms with what it means to be in solidarity with those who find themselves even more marginalized people who live under fascist regimes sustained by the US, people who live under occupation, folks in the US who live with the consistent threat of deportation looming over their heads, people in prisons and in jails, people on death row. I am seeking to find ways to be in deeper solidarity with those who live on American streets, sex workers, drug users, people living with HIV, my friends and my family members and my classmates who are hustlers and drug addicts and drug dealers and prison guards, my friends who work in chicken plants and peanut plants on trash trucks in the food service industry, my friends who also work two to three jobs, go into debt, scrape nickels and live paycheck to paycheck, if you could keep yourselves off of, if you could not put yourself on mute, uh, you could put yourself on mute, that would be really helpful because I just wanna name that. Um, it is the mute button that is the cause of, uh, it, triggers, uh, it triggers a lot of anxiety, uh, probably for me and for, and for others. So if you could try your best to keep yourself on mute, uh, and until uh, we um, open the space for All right, let's take a deep breath again in and out. All right. When I was writing the application, I said, I am interested in conversations about shifting the lived economic realities of black, brown, and poor people who simultaneously and intentionally or unintentionally participate in the US project of mass incarceration. I am 26 years old and in deep discernment about how I can be in solidarity with the people I care about without doing them further harm. Very first, the very first programming that I did as a Walter Wink Fellow was I had a conversation with Claude Copeland, who is probably here tonight. I had a conversation with Claude Copeland, uh, who was 18 years old when he went into the US military, either before or after, shortly before or after 9-11. And Claude, in this experience, recalled his experience of being face to face with death. Claude, a, a Black working class person from Queens, he recalled his experience of being face to face with death, his transition back into American life, and his later commitment to ending war and militarism with About Face, a collective of 
post 9-11 service members and veterans organizing to end war and the use of military weapons, tactics and values in communities across the country. Now, when I did this talk, it was the dead of winter and I was deeply depressed. But it was in that first conversation that I began to see my hopes and dreams for this fellowship come alive. It was in this conversation with Claude who testified of going to high schools and doing counter recruitment against the US Army and other military forces. And if he could do it, I figured, well, maybe we should be counter recruiting at job fairs for prisons and detention centers and mental hospitals and child protective services. And beloved, here is why. The military and the police are deeply intertwined. The military and the ways in which social services in this country are structured are deeply intertwined. When sheriff departments and police units raid and evict black families with black children where they are staying, with military grade tanks and weapons, we are still talking about warfare. When black and brown protesters are showing up to protest and are charged with terrorism, we are still talking about warfare. When the Department of Homeland Security and other forces escalate the killing, deportation, and incarceration of migrants, we are still talking about warfare. When we talk about a disproportionate number of Black families and Black children being surveilled and separated and controlled by child welfare departments for no other reason than being poor, receiving social services, relying on welfare benefits, living in public housing, and using public clinics, we are talking about warfare. When one in four individuals killed by law enforcement have a severe mental illness during so-called wellness checks, we are talking about warfare. When sheriffs and police officers are present and engaging in excessive use of force against Black patients seeking care in public health facilities, we are still talking about warfare. In December of 2022 alone, the Biden administration tripled down on policing, subsidizing more than $770 million to local law enforcement, and an additional $324 million to hire 1,800 new cops across the U.S. Concurrently, the Biden administration is preparing to propose $842 billion in the 2024 defense budget. And I wanna uplift my friends who are working their hardest to defend the land that is not city. To defend the land that is cop city. I'm gonna ask whoever is uh, on mute to mute them, not off mute to mute themselves. Or Ethan, you can remove them from the room. Put, or put them in the waiting room. I'm sorry, I have I, I do have a little bit of knowledge and safety protocol. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that if I need to. Okay, and you can ask them who they are. Great. Amen. <laughs> All right, when we talk about Cop City, $60 million coming from private sources when the black residents of Atlanta say no no way stop cop city my friends this is not a conversation about nonviolent versus violent strategies we're not in that conversation we are past that and again this is this is not to diminish the work of the anti-war and the peace movement but we are in another stage of development in our trajectory. We are talking about state violence. And when we think about what does it mean in this moment to not call on the state, we have to begin to think about community-based responses to violence. And that conversation alone takes time and energy and Bible studies and a lot of resources. 
But the work of finding community-based responses to violence in our own backyard is a peace task alongside an abolitionist one. We should be working to find ways that we can interrupt harm interpersonally and systemically and working to resource the thriving of all people globally. And how are we gonna resource the thriving of anybody when our billions of dollars are going not only to war, but are also going into police departments, social services that don't work, but rather surveil our people. How are we going to support the thriving of our people? I want to look now to the transformational work of Walter and June Keener Wink because when we start to think about these things, it is their methodologies that are gonna help us to build the worlds that we dream about without cops, without punishment, without militaries, without border regimes, without coercive psychiatry and care facilities and other carceral systems. This is a two-part series. And tonight, just tonight, we're gonna to continue the work of these foot soldiers for justice. Tonight, we're gonna to start asking rigorous questions. And then our tea channel, May the 20th, which we're gonna share more information about, we're gonna engage some religious and political text. We're gonna engage art. We're gonna watch The Shy, which is a coming of age drama based on life in a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. We're gonna engage both sides of our brains in the words of Walter. We're gonna engage our left and our right sides of our brain. And we're gonna role play community-based interventions to violence because how can we be about peace and nonviolence when all we know to call is the police? We're gonna strategize about how we can make May 20th event reproduce itself over and over and over again. We, I, want, I want us to think about how we can make political education, how we can make these workshops and make this curricula accessible in our communities. And hopefully we're gonna have fun doing it. And so with that, I have some peers uh, and I wanna hear what they have to say. Um, and so I'm going to direct our energy there. Uh, after that, my hope is uh, that we can create what I'm gonna call a compendium of questions. Whereas people can put in the chat um, or say aloud um, questions that come up for us. We're not gonna answer those questions tonight beloved. <laughs> We're going to leave those questions for FOR. We're going to leave those questions for the next week fellow to think about, to engage. Um, and yeah, I hope that I hope that we enjoy all of our time tonight. So the first uh, respondent that I have is uh, C. Uh, and I'm going to ask, uh, see, uh, how do you struggle? How do you struggle with philosophies of nonviolence in a violent world in your day-to-day -day work? Uh, what do you think about the peace movement in alignment with the call to abolition in your context in Ohio and in Central America? And so uh, after Chris, I'm going to ask Reverend, Reverend Chris to come uh, after Chrissy, after C, I'm going to ask Reverend Chris to come after, and then we'll end with Dr. Keisha. And so uh, with that, I hand the floor to C. Thanks, Tabitha. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, it's hard to follow you, not to follow you, but to go after you. 
um, because uh, your words were so powerful and I'm really grateful um, for all of the context that you started this conversation with. And uh, I'm really grateful for a lot of the things that you named that have been on my heart and my mind at different points in the last few years um, as someone who tracks and studies or attempts to uh, learn from uh, from movements and movement spaces and my own legacy and how to translate that into um, helping other people unpack their own positionality and um, to help us transform these behemoth um, systems of oppression that are really um, designed and intended to divide us and strangle us. Um, oh, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings and I'm, I have wrote down some notes um, during your reflection that I hope, so I hope that this will um, be a path that makes sense for folks. I want to start with the fact that the state maintains a monopoly on violence. And that truth helps me realize that um, and helps me unpack so much about empire and so much about nation states and how they're different from um, the communities to which we actually belong, right? I don't think that I find um, belonging with um, with every single person, because it's impossible for me to, um, to, you know, really be in relationship with every single person. I do find divinity and humanity in every person. And yet, um, I know, uh, whose I belong to and who claims me and who, uh, keeps me accountable. So that gives me, um, a little bit of an understanding of, what, how nation states align with imperialism and with empire. And um, someone told me once that uh, fascism is really imperialism turned in on itself, that fascism is um, a domestic form of imperialism. Imperialism being um, nation states that colonize and occupy and want to exert power and dominance over other um other sovereign entities beings um societies and fascism is the same sort of tendency um placed within um within a place that is defined and um against um the population that it is uh claiming to serve so that helps me understand what it is we're up against in this moment and that that we see rash fascism and um christian white nationalism and and hegemony um uh just taking hold and why i'm so grateful for for's work uh trying to uncover that um, Christian dominance and really speak out against uh, the U.S. support of um, of empire, both within uh, the belly of the beast and um, and the way that it proliferates. So we live in a violent world. And I am just giving you context. Um, no one identity uh, is should be represented as a monolith all of us have a nuanced understanding of our our of our realities and our life experiences and yet i am very much a millennial um i was uh coming of age after 911 when the us invaded iraq for the second time and then perpetuated a 21 20 year long um uh, war in the region in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, and uh, and terrorizing other places in the Middle East. And I was in college when the 2008 financial crisis happened. And basically, for my entire generation, anyone without inherited, um, i.e., stolen wealth, uh, has not really had stability <laughs> as far as. Um, as far as getting our basic needs met. In fact, that we are um, going deeper and deeper into 
um, different forms of modern day slavery as we're existing within late stage capitalism. And as a millennial, I have been desperate for years for my elders to be honest with me. And I am grateful when I find um, peers and mentors um, uh, who are of different generations who have been willing to tell the truth. But um, we, if we believe <laughs> that um, we exist outside of anything besides um, a violent society, I don't think that we're being honest with ourselves. Not to say that we can't have bigger aspirations, not to say that our faith does not call us to create and build and be and practice beloved community, but um, but but I this violence that exists um, and where it's coming from and where it stems from has not uh, has not really been always told truthfully. So I'm claiming that the state maintains a monopoly on violence. And so maybe it's semantic, but I don't think that we can um, we can say that nonviolence is um, is a reality in this violent world. And so I think that we all are here because we are called to resist violence. We all are here in this conversation because we believe that um, violence should be denounced always. I find from my um, faith teachings and faith practices that part of my mandate as a person of faith is to announce the good news and denounce injustice. And so I I'm I hope that you're following me there as as that um as that language piece happens. But I am grateful for the past few years how I have um found people who've been willing to to really speak um what has seemed true for me from my perspective, which is that frequently the type of whitewashed um, pacifism that I have been taught actually protects the state apparatus um, that maintains violence in our society. And I have noticed that the, you know, that you as an individual can be um, imprisoned for littering, but a train company called Norfolk Southern will never be held accountable for poisoning our land, our air, our water, our children, and our elders, right? And so I hold that reality as I'm trying to, un as I'm trying to root myself in an abolitionist framework. And I, and you asked me, um, what do I think about the call for the peace movement to move in alignment with the call to abolition? I don't think that these things are really separate from each other. I think that the peace movement is an abolitionist movement that has historically been focused on that imperialism externally, that stuff that happens over there, right? And we've called for the abolition of war the abolition of sanctions, the abolition of imperial violence on innocent people, quote unquote, over there. And what abolitionists, I think, in our context right now, um, within the United States, are calling for abolition of um, colonization on internalized, in, internally oppressed people who live within this um, empirical system. And so I think that everything that we're looking at is, um, 
you know, uh, Lucas Johnson, our former secretariat for the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, talks a lot about creative civil disobedience being um, a, a form of civil disobedience that turns the mirror on um, the oppressors, right? And that reflects back to them what exactly um, the oppression that they're doing is to others. And that's like, of course, I am someone who doesn't um, want anything to do with guns, right? I Even as I'm grappling with all of these things, I, and I'm trying to be honest about it, of course, I want to live in a space that is colorful and joyful, and that is creative in its resistance. But if we're going to turn the mirror on um, on these violent systems, which I believe that we can do, then we have to also be um, be looking in the mirror at ourselves, right? Um, looking at the speck in our own eye and reframing um, our understanding of punishment, reframing our understanding of redemption, remembering what Brian Stevenson has proliferated that we are all more than our most difficult moments or our worst behaviors or the worst version of our actions and ourselves, and that we're all deserving of redemption. And so as a police and prison abolitionist, I am more interested in what causes people to perpetuate harm. What causes people to perpetuate harm? Um, and how can we untangle those roots of harm? And how can we um, take responsibility for the times that we perpetuate harm as well? What does it look like to create a culture of care that is not disposable, that is committed to being in continual relationship with, um, with our communities, that says we're going to get through something, we're going to get through our conflicts in generative ways that um, continue to maintain people's dignity. And I know that some people will think that that's naive or idealistic, but you know what? We have to be creative. Like I said before, we can't keep doing the same old thing. And, you know, I, Dr. King said that violence begets violence. And what I've taken that is what I've taken from that in today's age is like hurt people hurt people. And how can we stop that cycle, those patterns? You mentioned this a little bit in your remarks, but um, interrupting criminalization this week had a really beautiful um, graphic note uh, that they created uh, from their most recent, uh, one of their most recent events, gatherings. And um, they had this Venn diagram. It was a, uh, it wasn't just two, I guess, I don't know what it, what it's called when three circles are, are intertwined together, but it was looking at the deportation system the family regulation system and the criminal carceral legal surveillance system and the ways that all of those systems are working together to try to maintain dominance over our autonomy and our bodies. And I feel like this happens at the individual level and it also happens at the institutional and um, societal level, that all of these systems are working together because of um, power, power that capitalism has granted through stolen wealth on stolen land, through stolen labor. And so I, um, I know, and I'm reminded just today that organized people are more powerful than organized money. And that is why organized money always works so hard to disorganize people. But let's um, let's just take us take a step back and look at where in the world 
are there systems of creative resistance, of care, of accountability, of transforming this harm that we perpetuate? And one of those systems, I know you asked me to focus on Ohio and Central America, but I'm not going to follow the rules um, because I'm a rule breaker. And I'm going to look at Rojava. And I'm going to look at the, the communities that have tens of thousands, the communes who ha that have tens of thousands of members. And I'm going to look at the model for community self-defense that, um, that they practice. And that model is one, not just in the community self-defense um, sort of uh, task force or working group, if you will, but also the peace task force, the conflict resolution task force, the governance task force, all of these working groups operate on a model of shared leadership where everyone has a responsibility for defending the community. Everyone has a responsibility for governing the community. Everyone has a responsibility for resolving conflict in generative ways. And so they practice a shared leadership structure where people take on assignments for six months at a time and where people of different generations and different genders are all working together collaboratively in a non-hierarchical way on um, the issues of safety and security and what that means. And what I see that look like in similar um, communal structures and autonomous societies in Chiapas, in El Salvador, in Honduras, in Colombia is, um, is that these, these working groups, they make it possible for people to develop stronger relationships, to actually know their neighbors, to actually know who we claim and who we claim to, um, that we're going to take care of, right? We're all gonna take care of each other. That is the motto in the streets. We take care of us. Um, one thing, uh, uh, one hat that I wear out of many is um, as a street medic. I, um, I love participating as clergy in different spaces, but I also really love participating as a street medic. And I don't love blood and I've never been great with needles, but I do really love care. <laughs> I do a lot of counseling work and the emotional first aid side of it. And I'll give you a Band-Aid and, and put a tourniquet on you or a splint if I have to, but um, I'm really there for that emotional and spiritual support. And a couple of our guiding principles are to do no harm, to share and decentralize knowledge and to prioritize calm and care. And those are um, values and strategies that I took with me into the fight to stop Cop City, where I was violently raided by um, SWAT, the Department of Homeland Security, and um, Georgia uh, State Police and Atlanta Police Department. And I used my training. I reminded people that I was unarmed, that I was disoriented. I used my training in creative nonviolence and and um, and uh, this calm care, do no harm oriented um, sort of uh, uh, value system. And what I saw in this movement to stop Cop City, which I am so deeply passionate about, because if you didn't know, I bet a lot of you do, the School of the Americas, also called the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, is just two hours down the road from Atlanta, Georgia. And Cop City has been called the next School of the Americas. And fun fact, one of the found funders of the Cop City project is Norfolk Southern. That same train company that poisoned the air 30 minutes away from where my mother and father live in East Palestine, Ohio. 
And that train company is headquartered in Atlanta. And that train company, along with many other funders, I'm sure, want to create other first responder training facilities. It's not okay. And in the resistance to this struggle, to this fight, the, in the resistance to, to Cop City, what we are seeing is a decentralized autonomous movement where people care for each other, where they actually, where they actually try to remove ego and shame and hierarchy from the ways that we interact with each other. It feels a lot more nonviolent to me than many, many nonprofit industrial spaces that have oper operated from a hierarchical top-down structure. And what I saw what I continue to see in this movement to stop Cop City is the movement taking to heart what the movement for Black Lives has tried to teach us, which is that we are to have leaderful movements, that no one person leads this struggle, that no one person is responsible for the safety of everyone, but that it is everyone's responsibility to keep us safe. And in this movement, we are seeing blatant, blatant overreach. There were three people who were um, charged with felonies this week because they were canvassing. They weren't even protesting. They were canvassing in public spaces and were charged with felonies of blatant violation of their First Amendment rights. People were um, in the forest celebrating with creative nonviolent non resistance at a music festival and charged with domestic terrorism. I think that my generation is realizing that um, that we've had to that we've had to be creative, but also that um, we don't want to sign up for the police and or military. The police and military are having a hard time recruiting, despite this massive influence of dollars, which you've already mentioned. And we've had a once in a lifetime investment in um, in our communities through the American Rescue Plan Act funding that was supposed to be for COVID relief. In my city, nearly 90% of the money that was almost $750 million is going to policing and incarceration. And they said that that money was explicitly not supposed to go for this reason, but <laughs> if we do not participate in democracy, we won't be able to enforce what our real values are. Um, I'm going to wrap up. I, I feel like I've been um, taking a long time, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, but there is so, so much to say. I feel like uh, I feel like Jesus taught me that property destruction is not violence when he flipped over a table. I realized that um, that the deacons of defense really helped Dr. King um, uh, maintain his work for, for a much longer period of time. I will never criticize uh, Miss Maria Rice, the mother of Tamir, for requesting self-defense um, when she goes out in public. But I will be there as a calming presence who commits to doing no harm, who commits to accompaniment, who commits to um, spreading calm, who commits to witnessing what is happening against us, 
and who commits to denouncing the real real injustices that we are facing and who commits to announcing the good news that the beloved community is for all of us and that it's up to us to build it. Mm. And let the people say amen. See. Yeah. All right, we're gonna transition now to Dr. Keisha, uh, who I've been in conversation with about the role of non-combatancy. Thank you, Tabitha. Mm -hmm. And thank you, C, for your framing around organized people and like intentional moral practice. Thank you for that. Um, Tabitha, you asked me about my position on non-combatancy as a faith stance and how those of us who are committed to non-combatancy or even pacifism can think critically about dual commitments to peace and abolition. And the one-liner that I would leave with you is we have to take responsibility and taking responsibility means being grounded in history. It means being imaginative. It means choosing ordinary practice and it means remaining committed to transformation. And so I'll touch on each of those, but first I'll share my stake, which is um, that I am a newcomer to the country. And I recognize that I am entering the story of the United States in the middle of a conversation that's several centuries old now a debate really about what this country is, on whose bones it's built, what norms there are for what does bind us and what should bind us. And I was raised Seventh-day Adventist in a tradition that is federally recognized and registered as a non-combatant religious tradition. Part of the arguments that have evolved for that within the Adventist context are non-combatancy in the name of the Prince of Peace, and non-combatancy in the name of the God who inspired a vision of swords that were beaten into plowshares. So we have historically over the last 160 so years, but not always in practice, opposed the use of state power for dominance or coercion. And so that's what undergirds the non-combatant position in the various wars that the US has waged over the last century, Adventists might have not answered the draft or answered the draft and said, I cannot lift this sword or this gun or this musket or answered the draft and said, I can only serve in the medical corps or answered and said, I can only serve in the chaplaincy. And only within the last 50 or 60 years have some Adventists chosen to volunteer for military service. And some of them have also chosen to bear arms, but my position remains the historic position of the tradition. Secondarily, I came into the US as an international graduate student. And so coming onto these college campuses, I would watch military recruiters pick off undergraduates like fruit. For some of those undergraduates, the military service was a path out of like a really closed economic situation. Uh, they weren't able to find jobs in their hometowns, but they were coming to the big city where the campus was and the military gave them a path to travel without debt, perhaps. But at what cost? At the cost of um, mental health, at the cost of physical health, at the risk of life. I think of uh, one of my friends who would drive me to church because at the time I did not have a car. Uh, he served in the military for over a decade. He came from Central America, um, did two tours in one of the occupied countries, uh, one tour in another, had nightmares when he came home, lost parts of his hearing. And it's complicated because he was bonded to the government for the period of his service to carry out the policy aims of the nation, whether or not he actually agreed with those policy aims. But as an individual, he became a cog in the wider system, as we all are, those of us who pay taxes, are contributing to the billions and billions of dollars that are assigned to the military, to the 
uh, police systems, um, whether or not we agree with those policy aims, we are entangled with them nevertheless. And so like thinking about those um, entanglements and entailments, I also remember one of the first pieces of culture shock was seeing the biggest United States flag I've ever seen in my life, still to this day, flying not over a police department and not over a military base, but over a used car lot. And so it gave me a sense like the violence of the state gets absorbed into ordinary commerce and daily life. It's not exceptional. It has become banal. And so we only see it if we have first assumed responsibility to see it and chosen to keep seeing it, even though it's normalized, even though it's made ordinary. So secondarily, I wanted to talk about like the religious origins as the fuel for some of the social violence, because as people of faith and moral courage, this is a term we use at Auburn Theological Seminary a lot to cover people who are religious and people who have ethical backgrounds, even if they are not affiliated with a religion, we have to track back to the first footfall of the first settler on this soil, many of whom were authorized by their European religious traditions to take over this land, so they said, uh, over the objections of the people who are already here. And as that's evolved in the last couple of centuries, it's become a, a form of Christian nationalism that the sociologists call Christian nationalism, which they say, uh, Andrew Whitehead and Sam Perry, they say this includes assumptions of nativism, white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, along with divine sanction for authoritarian control and militarism. And so white Christian nationalism is as ethnic and political as it is religious. That's from the book, Taking America Back for God. And then in the book, The Flag and the Cross, Philip Gorski and Sam Perry write, the holy trinity of white Christian nationalism is freedom, order, and violence, which means a kind of libertarian freedom for straight white Christian native born Christian men, order for everybody else, which means racial and gender order, above all, and righteous violence directed against anybody who violates it. And that is like the ideology undergirding the expressions, yes, and hatred of Jews and hatred of Muslims, order for everybody else, violence for everybody else, and safety and protection and freedom for the people who are inside the circle. So this, this is the, uh, the expressions that C talked about of impacts in foster care and in education and in the economy and in every other system track back to this ideology. And then I wanna say, there's a, uh, the, the line that you gave Tabitha, the military and the police are intertwined, it's still warfare. We're talking about state violence. Um, we often do look back to the 1960s as like the archetypal nonviolent era, because the, the rhetoric around the ways that protesters responded to the violence that was already inherent in the state of segregation, like that becomes our model for how contemporary protesters are supposed to act and respond. But the system adapts to our strategies. And the system does not care whether we choose nonviolence as a way of life, although it might be a meaningful ethical choice for us. When organizers and ordinary people are out in the streets expressing their right to free speech and assembly, they're still getting kettled, like uh, surrounded by armed guards and attacked and or murdered. And so as um, Ashley Woodard Henderson pointed out in a previous show um, conversation, Nonviolence has always coexisted with self-defense. And the work for us in our time is to imagine something different. Moral imagination is that act of taking in reality and getting aligned with the future that we actually deserve, a future in which all people can flourish, a future in which violence doesn't have the last word. And I think that's the prophet's work. As Brueggemann said, to help shape a new social community, to match the vision of God's freedom, to cut through the despair and to penetrate the dissatisfied coping that seems to have no end or resolution. 
we divest from the call to dominate. We divest from the calls of violence. And we're impelled by our divestment to practice new ways of community, to be joyful in how we craft new symbols, new language, new relationship structures, new practices to support the, the, the emerging vision for justice and peace. And it's an invitation to be creative about those symbols and to make them irresistible and to make them contagious, just as C was saying, even if the future that we're longing for might be deemed unlikely given the precedence of history or naive given human nature. Um, from my tradition and my experience, I'm clear that Black spirituality lived in community might be built on the ground of social oppression, but it encodes a really deep well of faith and value for all human beings that inspires resistance to systems of violence because that black oriented faith helps us to perceive a world that is otherwise. The status quo does not support the effort to hold faith. The status quo supports us becoming cynical about what other things are possible and what other perceptions are valid. And when I remember the promise that Martin Luther King appealed to when he was at the mall in 1963, before he said, my dream has turned into a nightmare. He said, there's a promise that the US has made to the people here. And when we rely on that promise, we're looking to the future for what the present has not provided. We first have to mourn the past and we mourn the deficiencies of the present in order to be open enough to the future that we are longing for, the future that we are promised. And Brueggemann says something else that's interesting to me. He says, those who have not cared enough to grieve, as in those who have not recognized the deficiency of the present, will not know joy because they are not then prepared to open to the future that we are longing for. And the final point I'll make, because I know we're short on time, is that Ruth Wilson Gilmore is an abolitionist, abolitionist scholar who has a background in geography and a, and a background in theater. She had a recent conversation with Krista Tippett in On Being, uh, where she was highlighting her convictions around freedom from, freedom for, and freedom with, i.e. freedom not just for me and mine and I, freedom for us and we and our, freedom that we exercise from violence, freedom that we exercise toward peace, freedom that we exercise with others. Um, and it's a practice, it's not a state. So I, I was hearing the opening comments from Tabitha about us transforming and not being transformed and moving toward a life that is centered in commitment to the will of God. And I love that. And it sounds to me like rehearsing our way into a state of peace, rehearsing our way toward um, flourishing, rehearsing our way toward uh, joy and delight and creativity um, and doing it in the most ordinary, ordinary practices, the listening carefully and the deference to another and the calm care in a moment of crisis and the willingness even tonight, like to stay with each other in a conversation that might have been disrupted. And these, this is rehearsal, not in the sense of waiting for another life where it will get better, but forming ourselves and our orientation and relationships right now in line with the ethics and outcomes of the world to which we are called. And so I hear Jesus who taught us to pray that the will of God would be done on earth and his astonishing teaching in the Sermon of, of the Mount around ordinary things, navigating conflict and dealing with taxes and scarcity and regulating our own sense of appoint, um, importance and learning how to trust others. So I think that's where I will leave it so that we have a little time to fresh. Thank you. Woo, that'll preach, that'll preach. I, 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 told, I told Dr. Keisha, I said, you're a preacher. <laughs> um, and I said that from an ego-centered place, I said, I know because I'm prophetic uh, and that'll preach, that'll preach. Uh, let's thank our uh, respondents for joining us. I also want to thank uh, Auburn and the Interreligious Task Force for 
co-sponsoring this. Uh, we um, also want to name uh, that we did have an expectation. You know, we we expected that Reverend Chris would get to join us, and we want to hold him in prayer. Um, we want to hold him in prayer. He had to leave abruptly. So um, let's hold Reverend Chris in prayer. Uh, these are trying times. These are trying times. In the words of my ancestors, uh, the devil is busy. The devil is busy. Uh, and so um, with that, uh, I've asked for a little bit of uh, permission because uh, we started this series off uh, in a hard moment. Uh, and so we have made it through and, and yet we got a little bit more work that we need to do. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you all for permission uh, to hold you a little bit longer in this circle and in this space uh, and to go into breakout rooms, actually, and, and to answer two questions. Uh, what did you learn today that was new? What did you learn today that was new? And what questions arise for you? Hi, friends. We, we are sorry for having to interrupt you from your powerful breakout rooms, but we hope that you had a really amazing time. And it feels as though we have a small enough group to where maybe one person per group can share maybe some questions or uh, something new, uh, just one person per group. I know that I didn't make that clear, um, but yeah, if you want to kind of just come back and share what your group discussed, it would be great. And then when we, we'll also close after after that, so. Shifra, you can go. Um, I'm off camera, so I would be on camera, but I can't, un I can't put the camera on. Um, well, I, I think um, what we shared was the, that it was really great the way you made the connections between so many things that people may not think of as war but actually being war, like the psych system, the police systems, a lot of the ways schools are. And that, I thought that was very powerful. And the need to question those kind of things, you know, that sometimes I see people on the, on the more progressive side that don't question, for example, the psych system and the amount of drugging that is going on and assume that that's really good for people. And I think it's something we really need to question because of how much destruction it wrought in my life. Um, and, and I've seen it in so many others, but, but also another question that arose was how do we kind of stay afloat and take care of ourselves in the middle of this? Cause I've been a political activist much of my life, but I've had such a struggle to take care of myself that it's very hard to, figure out how to plug in and at the same time be an activist and how do we, you know, um, keep body and, and soul together in the midst of that and come together when there's so much division, even sometimes among friends who are on the same side politically, like how do we unite? Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my group, we were got into a, a discussion that uh, <laughs> got cut short, uh, but we were kind of getting into like um, <clears throat> the power of like local um, organizing or what it means to like um, address issues of violence uh, within a community locally, as opposed to um, Right, I think like, I guess like in juxtaposition to like, I guess the current model of a kind of like top down um, nation centered idea of like, we can uh, see, we can make sure that everyone in this net, in this national border is safe um, or that the police are designed to enforce law and order um, within the, borders like the political borders of a nation state right so like yeah just thinking about what uh anti-violence means um and abolition means in the context of like smaller localities where um we know that like yeah like uh issues are often traceable to a, a local context um and so it's often difficult for um 
a national like kind of point of control to address the granular um, concerns and considerations that arise uh, within the myriad of contexts that exists within the nation itself. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I think that's what we were kind of getting at <laughs> a little bit. Right. I could just add to that I was in the same group as Vic, and I too was sorry we got cut off because I think we were just beginning to really uh, talk about this, but it's not only, at least from my perspective, not only defense in the sense of, you know, defending from violence coming from the state or whatever, but organizing to take care of one another in all aspects. And I was asking uh, Chrissy, who was in our group, about her experiences to elaborate on what she had seen uh, that she mentioned in her talk. Uh, and I just happened to mention that from what I have learned about Cuba and how the, uh, you know, the party operates in the communities and it's uh, so that people are helped people get their needs met, et cetera, and whether or not we within this system can begin organizing at the grassroots level, support mechanisms for people in, in, in all aspects of our lives. And I can't turn my camera on, so that's why <laughs> you still see breaking silence. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sahara. I'm going to pass it now to Jay Godfrey. Thanks, Tabitha. Um, we, we were talking more about the questions that came up for us. Um, we were intrigued by uh, the, I think that the language you were using about the culture of care, like how we move that forward that from a culture of violence. Um, I, I was thinking about how that this culture of violence that we live in teaches us that violence works. And so um, in order to unlearn that message while also trying to resist the ongoing messaging that, that, we, um, that becomes so deeply ingrained in us, it feels like, feels like we need practices um, or Dr. McKenzie, I liked your language of rehearsing um, a rehearsal, um, but we need practices, uh, um, both personal and communal. And so our question was like, what are those practices? Thank you, Jay. Y'all had a really revolutionary conversation. All right, friends, this was an amazing conversation. Um, I mean, this was really, really powerful and we held each other with care. And I wanna thank you for being here and thank you for being committed uh, to the practices. Uh, so what's next is that on May the 20th, uh, there will be a convers there will be a teaching uh, on violence or non on nonviolence or peace in a in a violent world. So we will basically be giving we'll give a teach in and we will model for people how to have conversations, how to do workshops in their local context. Uh, so we'll be using scripture. I said we'll be using some art. We'll be doing some uh, some body work and some movements some role playing. Uh, and uh, yeah, that'll be on May the 20th. And if you are on the list uh, for this event, then you will probably definitely receive correspondence about the next. Uh, and so with that, uh, I hope that everyone has a peaceful evening and I pray that you take care of yourselves. And if you need anything, I hope that uh, you decide to, uh, to ask for it uh, amongst your friends and your community. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone. And I think uh, to Paul, I'm sure that uh, there was there's a way that FOR is going to send out the recording. So thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you, Zohara.